Ladies and gentlemen, good evening to all. I am Irfan Siddiqui. I'm the current chair of the Berkeley Physics Department. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 26th annual J. Robert Oppenheimer Lecture. The Oppenheimer Lecture Series was started in 1998 and is made possible through the generosity of Jane and Robert Wilson, as well as Steve and Arlene Krieger. The series has brought a who's who of theoretical physics to Berkeley. Past Oppenheimer lecturers have included Mary Gelman, C.N. Yang, Freeman Dyson, Helen Quinn, Charlie Kane, Leonard Susskind, Stephen Hawking, Kip Thorne, Lars Bilstend, and our own Marvin Cohen. The lecturers have come from many fields of physics, including particle physics, condensed matter physics, astrophysics, cosmology, atomic physics, and biophysics. Robert Oppenheimer was born in 1904, growing up in an upper middle class family in Manhattan. He graduated from Harvard University, majoring in chemistry, entered Cambridge University in 1924 as a graduate student, hoping to work with Ernest Rutherford. In 1926, Oppenheimer left Cambridge to finish his PhD with Max Born in Göttingen. He published more than a dozen papers while with Born, mostly focused on the new theory of quantum mechanics. There are still many things that are new in quantum mechanics to this day. This included his most famous work, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation that simplifies molecular physics by separating slow nuclear motion from faster electron motion. More than 90 years ago, in 1929, after two years of postdoctoral study mostly in Europe, Oppenheimer returned to the United States. He accepted an associate professorship from Berkeley, where he remained for nearly 15 years. During this period, he published his famous paper with Volkov, establishing the tolman oppenheimer volkov limit on the maximum mass of a neutron star, the mass above which the star must collapse into a black hole. He also developed a theory of that collapse and black hole formation. Both topics, as we all know, are of keen interest today with the recent observation of gravitational waves from black holes and neutron star mergers. At Berkeley, Oppenheimer's group, typically eight to 10 graduate students and half a dozen postdocs, met with Oppenheimer every day, with Oppenheimer probing them on their progress on a daily basis. Hans Bethe noted that probably the most important ingredient he brought to his teaching was his exquisite taste. He always knew what were the important problems. The scientific leadership Oppenheimer demonstrated at Berkeley complicated his later life and his role in science. We have seen that on the big screen in the past year. In 1942, he was selected to lead the World War II Manhattan Project, its engineering lab sited at Los Alamos, New Mexico, near a ranch Oppenheimer owned. His leadership of the effort culminated in the development of the atomic bomb, a decision that troubled Oppenheimer for the rest of his life. After World War II, Oppenheimer became the public face of science and technology, featured on the covers of Time and Life magazine. This period of life came to a close with the controversial loss of his security clearance, a time when a new Cold War and McCarthyism was stoking fears. There was a resolution a decade later with Oppenheimer receiving the nation's Fermi Award. Oppenheimer's legacy at Berkeley is a much simpler one summarized by the plaque on the fourth floor of Physics South Hall. Another quote from Hans Bethe. In these corner offices, 1929 to 1942, J. Robert Oppenheimer created the greatest school of theoretical physics the world has ever known, from Hans Bethe. Berkeley Physics strives to continue this legacy today, and indeed, we add to the list of Oppenheimer speakers, Professor Andrea Liu, and it gives me great pleasure to ask Professor Carlos Bustamante to come up and introduce our Oppenheimer lecturer for this evening. Carlos. Good evening. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, this year's uh, Julius Robert Oppenheimer lecture speaker, Professor Andrea Liu. 
Andrea Liu uh, completed her bachelor degree here at Berkeley in 1984. She was telling me that when she was only 13 years old, she came to visit Berkeley and met with uh, Steve Louis, with Leo Falikov, and with um, Marvin Cohen. And so obviously she had to come to Berkeley for her degree, and she did. Uh, in, then after the degree, she, met, she moved to Cornell University, and in 1989 she received her PhD working on critical phenomena. After the PhD, she did two postdoctoral uh, training uh, uh, efforts. The first one was at Exxon Research Corporation, where she switched uh, her interest to study complex fluids. And during her second postdoc, she went to Santa Barbara, where she worked in the departments of chemical engineering, material science, and physics department working on polymer physics. At the end of this training, she joined the faculty at the University of California in Los Angeles in the chemistry department, chemistry and biochemistry department, actually. And she belonged to the group of physical chemists in that department. And she stayed there for about 10 years um, before moving to the physics and astronomy department at the University of Pennsylvania in 2004, where she is today. And she is now the Hepburn Professor of Physics and the director of the Center of Soft and Living Matter. Uh, Professor Liu is a theoretical soft condensed matter physicist that combines theory and computations to study soft and living matter. On living matter, she has been very interested in understanding the role of mechanics in biology, aiming at understanding how is it that collective phenomena can emerge at the subcellular level, at the cellular level, and even at the tissue level from collective molecular forces and interactions. On soft matter, she uh, has been very interested in studying jamming, producing so solids that are quite different to the perfect crystals. And these studies have provided a new way of thinking about the nature of rigidity on disordered solids. Actually, it was when she was starting these studies that I met Andrea back at UCLA, if I recall correctly. Andrea has received uh, numerous awards and recognitions for her work, including the National Science Foundation Career Award at the beginning of her career, a Simon Fellowship in Theoretical Physics, then she became a Simon's Investigator in Theoretical Physics. She's a member of the National Academy of Science, member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and a fellow of the American Physical Society. Tonight, Andrea will tell us about physical systems that can learn on their own. This is an area of great conceptual and practical interest. Biophysics, for example, uh, hopes to understand the phenomenon of self-organization that gave origin to the living state. To survive, the resulting structures require memory and adaptation. And adaptation is a form of learning that occurs in biology at many different time and, and spatial scales. Her presentation today will highlight physical systems that learn and perform machine learning tasks on their own with little energy cost. This system of artificial neural networks grow in complexity with their size, and therefore they open the opportunity to study a new paradigm for scalable learning. Please join me to welcome Professor Andrea Liu. Well, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here speaking today. Um, I had a wonderful uh, undergraduate experience at Berkeley. Um, still think of Berkeley as one of the best places on earth. And, um, and I think got a marvelous education here uh, from some, some of the people in this room. Um, so um, I'm going to talk today, and I I apologize a little bit because this talk sort of reflects my current obsessions. Um, and some of the ideas are maybe not completely 100% baked. Um, so, but, but I'm just very, very excited about them right now. And so I retooled my talk um, um, because I had to talk about them. Um, so 
What I mean by many more is different. Well, Phil Anderson, right, in 1972, coined the motto of condensed matter physics, which is that more is different, that the behavior of many bodies interacting with each other is completely different from what you get with just a few. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they're emergent collective phenomena. And as a condensed matter theorist, right, my, my purpose in life is, is to understand the microscopic origins of these collective phenomena, okay? But standard condensed matter systems, um, it's true more is different, but the behavior of many more is about the same as more. What do I mean by that? That simulations, for example, of 10,000 um, particles give us a lot of insight into what happens in experiments on 10 to the 20, okay? Um, and so um, things don't really change much as you scale the system up. Um, and so, um, um, and that is what distinguishes, you know, or ordinary condensed matter from the kind that I want to talk about today. And this grew out of just thinking about, this actually came from thinking about artificial neural networks, okay? Neural networks that live on the computer. Because the difference between neural networks of the 1980s and those now is that they've gotten a lot bigger, okay? And as they've gotten bigger, they are able to do more and more complicated things until they're actually able to do things that are very useful to us, okay? Um, and so their properties are really changing very dramatically with size. Um, and then, of course, you know, you think about brains. <laughs> brains are like that, too. Uh, if you compare C. elegans, which has 300 neurons, okay, to honeybees with about a million to us, right? Uh, well, we at least like to think that, you know, we can do a lot more, that our brains are capable of a lot more than, and than those of C. elegans. So, um, so that is a really, you know, as a condensed matter physicist, then I look at that, it's like, what makes those different, right? So that's the first question. Why is many more different in these systems? Um, and I'm gonna talk about that and two other questions today. What physical systems, besides brains, have this property, okay? So a neural network living on the computer is not a physical system. It doesn't have to obey physical laws, right? But what systems that have to obey physical laws have this property? And then finally, can we design a really simple system that has this property so that we can um, understand it in more detail? So, um, so let's think about it. The first question was, you know, um, what does it take to have this property? Um, so why is many more different in digital neural networks? We know the answer, okay? So let's think of a, a digital neural network. You feed it, for example, a bunch of inputs, for example, pixels of an image, right? Then the, you put these inputs, you grind them through the network, out come these outputs, okay, uh, that you can calculate. And um, suppose you want to distinguish dogs from cats. That's what everybody always wants to do for some reason. And so um, you want output one to be one if it's a dog, zero if it's a cat, and output two to be the opposite, right? But if you just start with some neural network, it's not gonna give you the right output, right? So this network is characterized, each node in this network has these adaptive, what I'm gonna call adaptive degrees of freedom. Those are called parameters. Um, in machine learning, okay, that are adjustable. And the way you adjust them is to say, all right, I'm gonna calculate this thing called a cost function. I'm gonna calculate, suppose I just apply the inputs and let the outputs be free to be what they wanna be, okay? That's what I call the free output. I wanna compare that free output to the output that I want, okay? I don't know which is bigger, so I have to square this and then I add this up over outputs, and then I want to go downhill in this function. I want to take this down to zero, okay, by adjusting these adaptive degrees of freedom, okay? So that's how this works. Um, it's trained when you reach zero or close to zero, and people in machine learning understand very well that the number of constraints that you can satisfy, in other words, each each of these things is a constraint that I want the free to be the same as the desired, okay? The number of constraints that you can satisfy increases with the number of adaptive degrees of freedom. 
And that's why many more is different, okay? Because the number of adaptive degrees of freedom is gonna increase with the system size. So you can satisfy more and more constraints. All right, so that's why many more is different. So what physical systems besides brains might have this property? Well, let's look again to digital neural networks, okay? So what are they learning, okay, when, they, when, when we do this thing of minimizing the cost function? Well, they're learning input-output relations that we want. In other words, we're saying, I want you to be able to tell dogs from cats, okay? So if I had a physical system instead of a digital neural network, right, <clears throat> I want to look for systems that have desired responses to stimuli. In other words, the stimuli are the inputs and the outputs are the responses, okay? So that's, that's the physical equivalent to an input-output relation, okay? So now what real systems have desired responses to stimuli? We can look at those and then we can say, all right, do they have adaptive degrees of freedom or not, okay? And if they do, then we're in good shape. So here's the first example that got us going on this, is um, proteins that have a property that's called allosteric. So, you know, man-made catalysts, they just go until they, they, uh, they fail, okay? They, they get fouled and they stop working. But biological catalysts, okay, can be turned on and off. General, many of them can be turned on and off. And the way many of them do that is by allosteric. So the idea is the following. So here's a protein, okay? Here's the, the small molecule that wants to bind to this protein and get chemically modified, okay? And then go off happy. At present, this, can't, this molecule cannot bind to the protein. It can't bind to the protein until this other kind of molecule, okay, binds here. Once this binds, it changes the conformation of the protein so that this can now bind, okay? So that's an example of turning the enzyme on, okay? This green molecule is turning the enzyme on so that this can now bind and do its thing, get chemically modified, okay? Um, and so this is actually quite um, common in many enzymes and signaling proteins. Um, and if I think about it, right, in physics terms, what are we doing here? Well, I'm applying, by binding this regulatory model, molecule, you're applying a strain right here, a mechanical strain, and you're changing the conformation of the protein, so you're changing the strain right there, okay? So this is a, an input strain giving rise to a desired output strain. In other words, this stimulus from this molecule here is giving rise to this response so that this can now bind, okay? So, that's like what a neural network does, all right? So now we ask, are there adaptive degrees of freedom? And indeed, right, of course there are, because at each point in the sequence of the protein, there was a choice of one of 20 possible amino acids, okay? Those are the adaptive degrees of freedom. Which amino acid was chosen to be at each point in the sequence, okay? And you can see that as the, the protein gets longer, as the sequence gets longer, okay, the number of adaptive degrees of freedom is increasing. All right, um, here's another example that I learned about from my brilliant young colleague, Eleni Katafori. So, um, so this is the brain vasculature, okay? So it's a network. You can think of a network of nodes um, connected by edges, which are to, you know, every pair of nodes, not no, pairs of nodes, not every pair of nodes, but pairs of nodes can be connected by edges, which are blood vessels, okay? Um, so the brain actually uses a huge fraction of the oxygen that comes into our lungs, 25% of it, okay? Um, and uh, there's always, you know, blood flow coming in through the arteries, okay? And then depending on what we're doing, okay, the brain vascular is adjusting to send extra blood flow to, what, to support what we're doing. So right now, my speech cortex is getting extra blood flow so that extra oxygen can get there to support it, okay? And I really hope your auditory cortices are getting that too. Um, so, um, so and, and, but you know, if I, 
if I stop talking and start jumping up and down, okay, you'd think I was a crazy person, right? But my brain vascular would adjust. And this is how fMRI works. Um, so um, it, that's, that's what it's looking at, is, is the, the oxygen. So, um, so the, and the, the enhanced uh, blood flow, the uh, enhanced oxygen um, at the parts of the brain, the brain that are being active. So what are the, that's an input-output relation, right? There's inputs coming in, big pressure drop across the artery, and then outputs depending on what part of your brain needs more oxygen. Okay. Um, and what are the adaptive degrees of freedom? They're, they are the conductances of the blood vessels. These blood vessels, are some are dilating, others are contracting to send that extra blood flow. So by dilating and contracting, you're changing the conductance okay, of, of each blood vessel or of the blood vessels in order to achieve the desired response to the stimulus. Okay. Um, so as a soft condensed matter physicist, I look at this and I want to come up with simple models to, to describe this. So for um, protein allosteric, instead of studying a protein, a real protein, okay, we studied simple networks connected by central force springs. So just springs that can stretch or, or be compressed, okay? Um, and for the uh, brain vasculature, instead of studying the actual brain vasculature, we study just flow networks, okay, just a series of pipes, okay, um, with a conductance on each different conduct, po possibly different conductances on each edge. And it turns out that if you're going to solve one problem, you might as well solve the other, because the mathematics are very similar. Um, and the way you can see that is in the mechanical force networks, okay, I want no acceleration of every node in equilibrium. Right, so the net force on every node is zero um, from all the springs that are attached to that node. Um, in the flow networks, uh, I have conservation of mass, and so um, the 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 um, you have Kirchhoff's law: no net current at every node. Okay, um, and so uh, and these are enforced in this case. Um, you get no net force on every node by minimizing the total energy of the system. And in the flow networks, you get no net current at every node, okay, by minimizing the dissipated power, okay? Um, and it turns out, I just wanna point out that the low Reynolds number of flow networks, okay, are identical to linear electrical resistor networks where I have a resistance on, e on each edge. Um, and, uh, and again, I have to satisfy Kirchhoff's law. Okay, so, and there, these are mathematically completely identical. You just substitute the word pressure with the word voltage. Okay, conductance is conductance, current is current. Okay, so now I've got my simple models. Now I want to introduce allosteric into them in the case of the protein. Um, so how am I gonna do it? Well, I apply an input strain. I'm gonna just call that one, okay? And I'm gonna say, I want my strain here, over here, I'm gonna say, I want that to be delta, okay? Um, and so I'm gonna take a leaf out of, you know, what people, computer scientists do and minimize the cost function, okay? So I compare the free target strain, in other words, I apply the source strain and I let the target be free to be what it wants, okay? And I compare that to the desired target strain, delta, okay? I don't know which is bigger, so I square it, okay, so that it's positive, and then I want to minimize it. I want to take this towards zero. When it's zero, my target strain in the free case will be exactly what I wanted. I will have solved it, okay? And I, I minimize this by adjusting adaptive degrees of freedom, which are the, the spring stiffnesses on each edge of the network, okay? Or they could be the equilibrium lengths of the springs, Okay, or the presence or absence of a spring, that's actually how we started. Um, and, uh, and okay, if that's, that's it, okay? Not quite, if this were an artificial neural network, this would be it, but it's a real system, it has to obey physics. And what physics? It has to have no net force at every node, okay? So at the same time, that I am minimizing this cost function by adjusting these adaptive degrees of freedom, 
I have to minimize the energy of the system with by adjusting the node positions in order to get no net force on every node, okay? So it's really a double gradient descent process, going downhill in two different things, in two different spaces at once. I want to minimize the energy, okay, with respect to the physical degrees of freedom, which are the node positions. And at the same time, I want to um, minimize the cost function with respect to the adaptive degrees of freedom, but they're coupled. Right? In other words, if I take a step downhill in the cost function, so I adjust the spring stiffnesses, the forces become unbalanced, so I need to rebalance them. Okay? And I just have to keep doing this okay? until the cost function reach, reaches zero. So that's the process, and it works. Okay? So here I applied a unit strain here. The strain here started out uh, two and a half orders of magnitude smaller. Okay? And as I, as I tune, Okay, as I change my adaptive degrees of freedom, the target strain goes up until it reaches the desired value of one. Okay, so it works. Um, and it works, here's a flow network, so I can apply pressure drop, imagine this is the artery, okay? Um, and I pressure drop here of one, and this is the initial pressure drop at the target, okay? And now I'm gonna start continuing uh, adjusting the, the, um, the conductances of the edges, and as I do that, the pressure drop against the target goes up, okay, until it, in this case it reaches the desired value of 0.2, okay? So that's done with this double gradient descent process. Okay, so now here's another set of systems. So I talked about proteins with allosteric, the brain vasculature. Here's a third set of biological systems, okay, that has, um, that I would argue has this property as well. So these are biological filament networks. This is the actin cortex that gives the cell its rigidity and shape, okay? Um, this is the collagen extracellular matrix um, that is between cells, okay? Um, and here is a fibrin blood clot, okay? Um, so maybe you should think about the blood clot as a thing that you're most familiar with, okay? Um, all of these systems, their purpose in life is to maintain rigidity, okay? Um, that's, that's their job, okay? The blood clot needs to stay uh, solid, not fluid, okay? That's the whole point. Um, and the interesting thing is that they are all maintain rigidity in what we would say is in a totally crazy way, okay? If I were to ask you to build something out of filaments, okay, that was rigid, you would not do it this way, okay? So what's crazy about it? First of all, they're what are called under-coordinated. If you look at, here's a node. There are three filaments coming out of it, three bundles of collagen, okay, coming out of it. Okay, so it's what's called threefold coordinated, okay? Um, it turns out that on average, so I have, I have in three dimensions, I have and to fix the position of a node, okay, I have three degrees of freedom. I have to fix its x position, its y position, its z position, okay? And um, it's fixed by these edges that are connecting nodes, okay? Each edge connects two nodes, so each edge counts as half, and so I need six edges from each node in order to constrain each node, okay? But they have less than that. Actin, the actin, in the actin cortex, they're cross-linked, so they have four. And the collagen uh, network, they have between three and four, and the same thing with fiber and blood clots, between three and four, okay? That's less than six. So how are they rigid? They're rigid by tensegrity, okay? If you put a tension on it, they can be rigid. So that means they have to maintain a pretty big pre-stress on them all the time, pretty big tension on them all the time, okay? Why is that hard? Well, <laughs> because on top of all this, okay, this is what you would not do if you were building this, your edges are constantly being removed and other edges are being added. So much so that in the actin cortex, the whole cortex is turning over every minute, okay? Every single edge in this thing has turned over in about a minute, okay? Um, and how are the edges removed? Well. All of these three systems share this common thing. They all have 
enzymes, uh, cofilin for actin, collagenase for collagen and filament for the fibrin blood clots, okay, that cut um, filaments that are under low tension, okay? On top of that, the filaments can grow um, uh, so they can replace themselves. Okay, so um, when biologists talk about this, you know, they call this um, use it or lose it. In other words, it's nature being thrifty. If I'm not using this edge, I'm just gonna take it away and use it somewhere else where it could actually support a stress, okay? Um, so, um, but I would like to argue it's much more than that, okay? Because these networks have desired input-output relations, okay? What is, what is it? They are maintaining rigidity, okay? In the face of constantly changing stresses on them, okay? Just imagine you're building something out of filaments. It's constantly being buffeted by st strong earthquakes in every possible direction. It's being tugged on in different ways, okay? Um, and it has to maintain rigidity in the face of, of that, okay? So what is the point of having these enzymes that are cutting and removing filaments? Well, it, they are creating adaptive degrees of freedom because each edge can now either be there or not there. It's a binary degree of freedom, okay? And so as I increase the system size, right, the number of edge, edges is increasing with system size. The number of adaptive degrees of freedom is just increasing with system size. That means there are lots and lots of adaptive degrees of freedom. What that means, and, there, and all this thing is trying to do is maintain rigidity. Okay, the system, that means the system in machine learning language, AI language, is over-parameterized. There are a lot more degrees of freedom than there are constraints. And there are certain things that we know from machine learning um, and what that means for, uh, about over-parameterization. That's the limit that all digital neural networks are working in. They're huge. They're much larger than they need to be because over-parameterization is good. Why is it good? It means that there are many good solutions, okay, to whatever problem that you're trying to teach your neural network to have, okay? Um, many different solutions means that, that many good solutions mean, means that, okay, think of each cell or each blood clot. Each blood clot has a different network, okay? But each network is still able to maintain rigidity. Each network is a different solution, okay? Um, the other thing we know about overparameterization is that systems tend to fall into minima, okay, that have very big basins of attraction, meaning that there, there are many degrees, in many directions in which things are flat. That if I change a parameter, I'm not gonna change the, the quality of the solution very much, the error very much, okay? And so, um, there are lots of flat directions because these networks are overparameterized. There are lots of directions that I could change my edges, retake, remove, or, or, or add edges that are not going to change the rigidity much. That's right, right? Because they're, they're undergoing turnover. There's also this thing called representational drift. That is, that, that people know in neuroscience, that if you look at the neurons that store one of your memories, and then you look at the neurons sometime later, some years later, it's a different set of neurons, okay, that are storing that same memory. And that's how, you know, in this case, each network can maintain rigidity despite turnover. You can get that in, in, in deep neural networks as well uh, by using a technique called dropout, where you just remove and add nodes all the time, and that's exactly what the system is doing. It's doing dropout in order to have representational drift so that the, each network as it's evolving, is still maintaining this memory of rigidity. Okay, so it's not crazy at all. It's damn brilliant, okay, um, that, that these networks do things that way. Um, but I think you have, I hope you've gotten the message that, right, thinking of biological function from this point of view is actually a useful way to think about things. Okay, I'm going around like a missionary spreading this message everywhere. Um, this is a really great way to think about biological function. All right, so, um, so the answer to this question, what physical systems besides brains might have this property that many more is different, is that 
is living matter systems, okay? Um, that have either adapted or evolved or adaptive desire to input output relations or functions, biological functions, okay? Um, are a really good place to look. All right, so that's great. We can study these living matter systems. I am, you know, I, as a living matter theorist, I'm studying them, okay? But as a soft matter theorist, I want to say, can we now design a really simple physical system, not a living system, that also has this property that many more is different, okay? Um, all right. So if we think about the three kinds of biological systems I've been talking about, allosteric proteins, brain vasculature, et cetera, say, all right, they are all satisfying these desired input output relations by adjusting adapted degrees of freedom. So how are these adapted degrees of freedom adjusted to lower the cost function, okay, uh, to get the, this, these relations? Well, in allosteric proteins, that was done by evolution, okay? And evolution is, we know evolutionary algorithms, right? That's a way of doing gradient descent, okay? So that is, in fact, how that what evolution is doing. It's going downhill, all right, in this cost function. All right, but... Um, if I think about the other systems, the brain vasculature and filament networks, they are adapting in real time. Their, their adapted degrees of freedom are changing in real time. That's not evolution, okay? How are they doing it? I'm not gonna get into that, but I just wanna point out that they are managing to do it without a computer, okay? They are not hooked up to computers that are calculating the gradient descent, unlike digital neural networks. So that started think, uh, got us thinking, well, okay, how can systems learn on their own, okay, without being connected to a computer? And of course, the brain does that, right? So let's think a bit about the brain and compare a brain to digital neural network. So in the digital neural network, doing, going downhill and adjusting the, the adaptive degrees of freedom to lower the cost function, requires knowing everything about the network. You have to know every last detail. And then you figure out how to go downhill, like ChatGPT4 has about a trillion parameters. So you have to go downhill in a trillion dimensional space, okay? And that requires a lot of computation. Um, of course, they can do a relatively narrow range of tasks compared to the brain. Um, and they take a huge amount of energy compared to the brain. The brain actually takes a huge amount of energy for us, okay? It takes about 20% of, of our energy, okay? Um, but um, think about all the things the brain is doing, okay? Um, and it's operating on about 2,000 kilojoules per day, okay? Every time you generate an image with DALI, okay, it's 10,000 kilojoules, okay? five times what your brain uses in a whole day, okay? It's not free. In fact, it's enough to run the average electric car 10 miles, okay? So think about that, the electricity, just the electricity to run the already trained neural network to generate this image, okay, is, is huge, okay? Um, so the brain does this. How does the brain do it? without being hooked up to a computer, well, neurons are updating their synapses without knowing what every other neuron is doing, right? They're doing it by what's called a local rule. That's what we mean by a local rule, that the updates are being done without knowing what everybody else is doing, how every other adaptive degree of freedom is changing, okay? And that, for, the, for brains, right, that adaptive rule is, you know, neurons that fire together, wire together. Um, but, uh, okay, what we want is a system that's a lot simpler than the brain so that we can study it. And, and okay, lots of people study the brain very productively, um, but we wanted a very simple system. So we decided to just take one step closer to the brain just to, do, to come up with local rules to update, oh, that should be adaptive degrees of freedom, to update them by local rules, okay? So that's what I want to tell you next. So how do you do that? Use physics, okay? So let's think, I'm gonna now put this in the language of an electrical network, which you remember is the same as a flow network, just with the word pressure 
replaced by voltage, okay? So the idea is I wanna apply a voltage drop, for example, between these two nodes, and I want um, a desired voltage drop across these two target nodes, okay? So um, my cost function is the free response. In other words, I apply this voltage drop and I leave the target to be free to be what it wants to be. I wanna compare that free response to the desired response and I square it. That's my cost function, right? I'm now going to do a little switch. Instead of minimizing this cost function, I'm gonna consider this contrast function, which is the power that's dissipated in what I'm gonna call the clan state minus the power in the free. And what's the difference? The clan state, I apply the target voltage that I want to have, okay? So these are two different boundary conditions. Here I just apply this voltage drop and I leave this free. Here I apply this voltage drop and I apply the voltage drop that I want, okay? The idea is I want the free state to be the same as the clamped, right? If I have just the, all the resistances right, then the voltage drop here will be the same as in the clamp case, all right? But the system naturally wants to minimize the power. So let me think about this, okay? If I have the clamp state where I'm applying the desired response and now I take this applied voltage off, it's gonna go back to this. This has a lower power. So I know that this difference has to be greater than or equal zero. Physics just tells me that. What that means is I don't have to square it, okay? Here I had to square it because I didn't know which is bigger. This one, I know which is bigger. I don't have to square it. And so I can just go downhill in this. So what's the result? So now, okay, I'm going downhill. I'm changing my conductances according to the derivative of the clamped minus the free power with respect to the conductance on edge J. What you see is the power is the voltage drop squared across each edge, okay, times the conductance of each edge in the clamped and the free state, okay? I take this derivative, right? All the terms where I is not equal to J dropped out, so this is, in the end, the update to the conductance on each edge just depends on the voltage squared in the clamp case minus the voltage squared in the free case for that same edge. In other words, this is a local rule. I don't know what all the other edges are doing. I don't care. I just adopt, adapt my own conductance according to this rule, okay? Um, why can each a resistor updating itself by this rule lead to collective uh, learning of this task? because of Kirchhoff's law. That's what's coupling everything, okay? All right, so, um, all right. So that's the idea, okay? So, but on the, if I do this on the computer, it's still a problem because, okay, the second descent, gradient descent on the cost function with respect to the edge conductances, I replaced it by this local rule, excellent. But I still had to satisfy Kirchhoff's law at every node, and that requires computation, right? That's not good, aha. But if we do it in the lab, okay, physics will do it for us. We don't have to lift a finger and physics will just satisfy Kirchhoff's law at every node and we'll do it very rapidly, okay? So we don't have to worry about it, okay? So this has to be implemented in the lab. So this is where we were in the summer of, uh, spring and summer of 2020, stuck at home, okay? and you know, this great rule, and my husband, Doug Durian, is a soft matter experimentalist, um, and I was saying, we've got this great rule. It's so fantastic, but it has to be implemented in the lab, and I have no idea of how we could possibly do it. And he went away and thought about it, and he came up with a way to do it, okay? So, um, so we hired a brilliant postdoc, Sam Delavu, and he started in September of 2020, okay? And the first generation just has these digital variable resistors, okay, that can take on 128 different values, okay? And, but here's the problem, okay? The local rule depended on comparing the voltage drop across this resistor with the clamped boundary condition to what you get under the free boundary condition. 
And you can't apply two different sets of boundary conditions to the same system at the same time. Okay? So how do you get around this? Okay? This is, on the computer, it's easy. You do the clamp condition, you stick the, enter, the answer in memory. You do the free condition, okay? You take it out of memory, compare, and update, okay? But we don't want a memory. We don't want a processor. So what Doug came up with was the idea of identical twin networks, okay? So I have two networks, a free network and a clamp network. I put them right on top of each other, okay? So each edge here is really two edges, the twin, identical twins, okay? Um, and so, uh, and so here's an edge from our original first generation. I have one sitting on my desk, okay? So um, the free variable resistor, the clamped variable resistor, and then some circuitry to compare the voltage drop across the two, okay? And then just to update the resistance depending on the sign of that difference. We didn't even implement the exact coupled learning rule. So Sam built it by hand, okay? He heroically assembled 16 of these, okay, onto breadboards and connected them, you know, nine nodes with, six, with these 16 edges, okay? Um, all right, so that was our first prototype, and it worked. We couldn't believe it. Okay, so here, here's the IRIS data set. So we're very, very proud of this. I have to say computer scientists are absolutely contemptuous. And when we tried to get this published, people said, if you can't you know, uh, classify ImageNet with 10 million images or however many, don't even talk to us. Okay, but all right. But we were very proud of this. So, so some poor guy um, did four measurements, okay, of the iris, the length and width of the petals and sepals, okay? And then he measured this for 150 irises, okay? 50 flowers from each of three species, okay? And the task is to classify, to figure out from these four measurements which species the flower belongs to, okay? So, um, so here is our network. We have nine nodes. One node is ground, okay, that's taken. Then there are four input nodes where we put in these four measurements translated into voltage, okay? Then there are three species, three targets. So there's only one node that's not being used here for as an input or output, okay? Uh, so this is really the most complicated thing, just about the most complicated thing we can do, all right? And this thing reached a classification accuracy of 97%, which is comparable to linear classifiers on the computer, okay? So we are very, very proud of this. Uh, we trained on 10 flowers for each species, tested on the remaining 40. Okay, this is great, except, right? What many more is different requires is that you need the number of adaptive degrees of freedom to increase with system size, okay? Our adaptive degrees of freedom are the, are the resistances or the conductances on the edges. And it turns out that for linear resistor networks, okay, it's not true that the number of adaptive degrees of freedom is gonna increase the system size. Because you can take the network and you can mathematically transform it into a network where all the inputs are connected to all the output, all the inputs and outputs are connected, okay? Um, and so it doesn't, the number of adaptive degrees of freedom doesn't increase the system size, it increases with the number of inputs and outputs, okay? So that's not good enough. Also, we know that in machine learning, linear models uh, can't do very much. They're not very powerful. We need nonlinear models, okay? So that's our second generation. So here it is. It's a transistor-based version. It's highly scalable um, in principle. Um, the edges now have these slightly nonlinear IV curves. And um, I'm just gonna say here it is. We're just doing a square lattice now. We might as well, okay? Um, so here, are now, with the help of an undergraduate this time, assembling Ben Beyer, assembling 25 of these uh, and connecting them with um, 16 nodes, I think, I forget. Anyway, um, uh, now implementing the exact coupled learning rule. And this system is already more than 10 times faster than doing the same, solving the same thing on the computer. Why? Because Sassman-Kirchhoff's law with nonlinear resistors 
is really slow, okay? So um, it's hard already, even this system is uh, faster than our simulation. And this can learn now nonlinear classification. So you put in two inputs here, and the idea is you have these test data, which are these blue points and gold points, and you want the training data, the blue and the gold, and you want um, to be able to, that if you give me a point here, it tells you it should be blue. If I give you a point here, it tells me it should be gold. And what it, what it actually tells you before you start training is the color, the background color. Okay, so it does not get it right. The black is the decision boundary between the two. And this is the system as it's learning. And what you see is that in the end, this decision boundary is curved and it um, classifies the data correctly and it's curved. And if it were the linear resistor network, it wouldn't be able to be curved, it would be straight. Okay, so this is nonlinear. Okay, so it turns out that people with you know, severe epilepsy sometimes have to have you know, half of their brains removed, they can still function, and people can have strokes and recover. Um, and so the brain is really very robust to damage, okay? Um, so are our networks, and that's because each edge is learning on its own, in parallel. They're all learning on their own without knowing what everybody else is doing. And so here I have a system that's learned, okay? So the error has gone down, and then I remove this brown edge, okay? Oh, the error went back up, but it learned again, okay? You just wait and it learned it again. Remove the gold edge, error went up, it went down again, it learned it, okay? Remo take the purple edge, and it didn't even have to relearn anything. In fact, most of the edges are like that, and that's known for, for digital neural networks as well, okay? So, um, so this system is incredibly robust to, to damage, okay? Um, and uh, and that's exactly what you need in order for this to be manufacturable. Because if we're going to take this and now put it on a chip, okay, there are gonna be mistakes, okay? But Sam found that these networks were just hell to debug because they kept working, okay? Um, yeah, they, they'd work, oh, it's great, it's working. Then put the input somewhere else, I'll put somewhere else, ah, oh, it's working, no problem. Put them somewhere else, suddenly it stops working because there was a bad edge. Okay, so, um, so the system tends to learn around defects, okay? Um, because they're, they're being, every edge is, is adjusting in parallel. Okay, so our second generation on the breadboard is already using very little energy, 10 picojoules per adjustable adaptive degree of freedom per inference, that means solving a, a, a known task that this, this system's already changed to do, okay? That, is already within striking distance of the most energy efficient state of the art chip, okay, where it's one picojoule per parameter per inference, okay? Our next step is to put it on these uh, printed circuit boards, okay? Each edge is a printed circuit board. We ordered five, of course, there was a mistake, there was a box that we had to fix it, so now we're waiting for the, for, 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 for 100 to arrive. We should be able to get to 200 edges by hand this way. But we now have a third generation that uses subthreshold transistors, even more um, uh, energy efficient, and um, using even fewer electronic components per adaptive degree of freedom, so that if, if, this is a big if, everything scales up as we hope, then with the third generation design, we should be able to reach a billion adaptive degrees of freedom per chip. Um, and we should be able to do six orders of magnitude better than the current state of the art in terms of energy um, usage, at one at a joule per parameter per inference, okay? If it scales up. So that's what we're, okay, we have, we have a money problem uh, <laughs> to do this, uh, but, but there's actually a class at Penn. Anyway, it's okay. We're doing it through a class that's offered at Penn. It means we had to wait a long time, but we should have them by the end of this summer. Okay, so uh, just to summarize then, the simultaneous optimization, right, of a cost function and the physical energy or power, okay, um, gives a systematic way of solving inverse design problems. If I want a system that will solve a given problem, have a given response to stimulus, this is how to do it. 
okay? Um, and uh, but biological systems that adapt in real time have to use some physical learning. They have to have these local rules, they have, okay, and physical objects to, to accomplish this. Um, so what I showed you was a framework, a couple learning framework that gives a way of developing local rules to go downhill, to solve these inverse design problems, to go downhill, to do gradient descent on a cost function. It's not the only way to do it, okay? And the biological systems do not use coupled learning, okay? Um, so, so it's just one way to do it. Um, but that allowed us then to have a very simple physical system that can be scaled up where we can look. It's a system of identical components following identical local rules and it is learning tasks. Learning is emerging as a collective phenomenon. To me, this is like the most thrilling you know, set of questions that I've ever um, uh, uh, tackled in my career. So I, I, it's very interesting. Um, it's potentially useful, okay? Um, but, you know, I think it's exciting, right? Because it is this really weird kind of condensed matter where many more is different. And if we can understand that, I think that's sort of foundationally important for understanding function in living matter. So, um, ah, this is the Oppenheimer lecture. So I thought I should say something. I wonder every day, should I be working on this or should I stop? Because, <laughs> okay, the pros, right? You wanna do AI sustainably, okay? And it's very cheap if we do it this way. Now, right, the big corp tech corporations have a, a lock on the big models, okay? Uh, they're, they're completely secret about it. Nobody can study it and figure out what are they, how are they learning, what are they picking up on, okay? Um, that's dangerous. Uh, and and, uh, and they, they really have, um, that, you know, uh, ordinary people are just completely locked out. If we can make it much cheaper, of course, that's good. But of course, it's also bad. Because <laughs> if you make it cheaper, maybe you could make even bigger systems with even more parameters, right, if you're a large corporation. Um, and AI can already be used in very dangerous ways. Um, and so um, I think the good thing is that I don't think they can get much bigger because they're already using a really good fraction of all the data that's out there. Um, and so maybe it's, it's not only that you need the system to get bigger, but you need more training data, okay, to get many more is different. And there is a limit to how much training data we have. And we're, we're, we're basically there on these large language models. So, um, so I don't know how to think about this in a systematic way, and um, I don't, I hope I don't totally hijack the discussion with this, with this but, um, but it is something that I worry about. Um, here are the people who did the work. Um, I especially want to highlight Naki Stern, who came up with a coupled learning rule, and Sam Dillabu, who built the circuits, uh, first and second generation. Um, um, all of this came out of work that was done on jamming, and then we took it towards, you know, uh, Alistair and stuff together with Sid Nagel, uh, my collaborator now for almost 25 years. Um, uh, the stuff on the circuits, um, Doug Durian uh, um, designed um, uh, the first generation. Um, Mark Miskin designed the second generation colleague of ours, in, a brilliant colleague in, in electrical engineering. Um, and these people funded it. And if you thought this was fun, come and join us at Penn. Adam Frim is already doing that. Um, so come and join us, uh, graduate studies, postdoc. Okay, come and visit us on sabbatical. Um, it's, we have over 60 faculty across soft and living matter. These are people who were trained in soft matter, okay, uh, or living matter. Um, and not biologists, no biologists say, oh, I, I work on living matter. No, they do biology. Um, and, uh, <laughs> Right, uh, but and these people, we have so many. I mean, you cannot beat the breadth and depth of soft and living matter at Penn. Um, these are people are spread across about a dozen departments. So anyway, thanks very much. Hi, thank you. Um, it's a really amazing talk.
So I got a question. Um, at the very beginning of the talk, we talked a little bit about the rigidity of the neural network, right? And um, um, so I just want to ask, do you have any comments or any further elaboration in the aspect of the physical neural network you are doing for now about the rigidity we have been observed? So um, yeah, I was talking about rigidity in the actin cortex, the collagen exocellular matrix, and, and fiber networks, um, which are turning over constantly but maintaining a rigidity. Okay, so uh, we have simple examples on the computer. Again, just central four spring networks. Okay, um, uh, and it's very interesting. We can put in this local rule that you want to cut filaments that are under low tension, but we find that if we add filaments randomly, that's not good enough. We can't maintain rigidity and turn over the whole network. So there's some rule for how you, local rule for how you add things that people aren't aware of, but there has to be such a rule. And we're trying to figure out you know, what such a rule might be. So I think this is an, a way in which these questions, or this way of framing the problem is interesting for biology because it says, okay, let's think of adaptive degrees of freedom. Let's think of local rules that project onto the direction of gradient descent, okay, that the system might have. What are those local rules? Those local rules are carried out by proteins, by gene expression, depending on the case, okay? So, um, uh, so how does that work, right? You know, I think it raises interesting questions. Hello, thanks for your amazing talk. And I just have uh, questions about, first is, I have two quick questions. And first is about the, uh, uh, when you talk about the uh, free and academic network, and if it's a um, linear network, and I can imagine that the uh, energy landscape is convex, and you can have a, a minimum, and it's a climb network, and I have a larger energy. But when you talk about a nonlinear uh, uh, circuit, and the energy landscape gonna be very complicated. And what if the climb network's energy is in a, uh, a local minimum and that we could be even smaller than the free network? And the second is, uh, uh, do you have any comments on the uh, cost function? So I saw you are using a, a, a mean square cost function. What if yeah. you are using different cost functions such as soft mass or something else? Does the network still lowering the, the cost function? Depends on the, uh, the formula or, yeah. So. Yeah, so the cost function is, is um, determined by the training examples. It's determined by the boundary conditions, the clamped. That's where the cost function is coming in because I've replaced the actual cost function by this contrast function, which is defined by the boundary condition. Okay, yeah. so that's, that's how that happens. And then your question was, okay, what if I have nonlinear resistors? Okay, it actually turns out it's not power that's dissipated anymore to satisfy Kirchhoff's law. Uh -huh. Okay, so now in the absence of actual non-monotonicity in the IV curve, it, it, it should still be convex. Um, so I should still be able to minimize it. Now, how do we guarantee that the clamp is in the same as the free is is by nudging, so I didn't talk about this, but instead of applying directly the response that you want, okay, you take the free response and you just apply a voltage drop that's closer to what you want, just a little bit closer, just a little bit away for free. So you just nudge your way up to the actual desired solution. So I, I skip that subtlety, but it's very important, okay, and that's what causes this to converge. I see, thanks. Good question, really good questions, yeah. Hi, wonderful talk. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, hi, wonderful talk. Um, I, 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 this reminds me of a talk we had here uh, about f seven years ago about crushing rocks, but we'll have to talk later about that. She, she discovered uh, the way that the hemoglobin could com communicate through itself by by the crushing of, I don't know if you're familiar he with that. He uses Alistair, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, my yeah. question is, don't you have to solve the Kirchhoff's laws simultaneously with the, with the cost function law? 
I, I mean, you, you, you seem like you're saying you're saying doing it one step at a time, and it, it seems like you, if you, you, you do the, the, the first one and then the second one, then you go repeat the first one and the second one. That's right. So you they're take in, step, interleft. You take, take a step downhill in the cross function by adjusting uh -huh. your adaptive degrees of freedom, and then you calibrate your physical degrees of freedom, okay. and then take us another step and, and just keep going back and forth. Do you ever get the obnoxious right. situation where they just go A, B, A, B, instead of A, A, A prime, B, B prime? Does it ever go back to the same thing? No. No. no, no. And then the other thing is, like, can, can't you just get the nonlinearity without going through completely nonlinear for the XOR function just by doing an inverse? I don't know how you do an inverse on these systems. But if you did an inverse, you could, you could, use, the XOR, you could use the identity for the XOR. I'm not quite sure what you mean by an inverse. So in our third generation of a subthreshold transistors, we're actually just using a nonlinear mapping so that there's an effective... Uh, conductance and there's an effective voltage difference, okay, which are just nonlinear functions of the actual. So, so, so we can. So it's very, it's a very nice thing. So we're just actually using mappings onto from the nonlinear circuit uh, in onto okay. the linear circuit. Um, I should, uh, I should say, one thing that you brought up. Um, you don't have to completely calibrate the physical degrees of freedom with each step in the adaptive degrees yeah. of freedom. In other words, there's a learning rate, right. and there's a rate of physical equilibration, right. which is the RC time, right. okay? Right. And um, which can be very, very, the smaller we get, you know, the lower, right. that the faster that time scale is gonna get, and that's the origin of these numbers. What's your scale on the capacitors? Yeah. What, so, what is your, so, what, so what? the point that I wanna make is that you would think that the physical equilibration has to go all the way at each step, of uh -huh. changing, but it's not true. Yeah. The learning rate does not have to be incredibly, in, infinitesimally slow compared to the physical rate of equilibration. In fact, we can speed up uh, the learning rate to be almost the same, almost as fast as the rate of physical equilibration with almost no cost and error at all. So that is something that we discovered, which is very handy for a lot of things, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it's a really good talk. I've got two questions. Uh, one of the questions is around the fact that it was good to hear that the cost to train and cost to infer is going down. Um, but these sort of uh, networks like ChatGPT take a lot of training data to train. Um, how does that com compare to a system like yours? I had a second question and mine is blanked out. Um, but yeah, that was the first question. So we don't know. Okay. okay. We, we really don't know. Um, you know, we've been able to do these simple tasks, but we have very small systems. So we're, yep. we, we really need to scale up. And so, you know, what we're doing now on the computer with the third generation is to solve it on the computer first while we're waiting for our chips to come back, okay? Um, to, to solve it, to, to classify the MNIST data set, the handwritten digits, digits yeah. okay? Yep. Yep. So, and, and we'll find out then how much training data we need to do it and how big of a system, how, how efficient it is. Cool. Yeah, we don't know. Question number two, if I have time. Uh, if, if you have, um, have you looked at what nodes learn what when you're trying to learn them and or at a lo lo local scale? Do you see different nodes learning the same thing and then if there's a flow there? Yeah, these, again, these tasks are a little too simple. Uh -huh. Okay, so... I think that's very interesting. And you know, that raises this question of arch architecture, right? Because in neural networks, people find that different layers of the, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Different, <laughs> what did I do here? Uh, I don't know what I did. Uh, different layers of the neural network um, learn sort of different things, are responsible for different aspects of, of, the, of, the, of the computation. And so uh, it'd be really interesting to see if that's the case in ours. We just have right now a square lattice architecture, and it could be good to have a more hierarchical sort of structure in order to do that. And that's one of the many questions that, that we need to explore. Awesome. Thank you. Please come and join us in exploring these problems. It's a lot to do. Uh, yeah. yeah, yes. One, one question in, with regard to the last classification technique with the nonlinear non stuff, are, is that susceptible at all to adversarial attack uh, in, in terms of sort of 
tip, tipping the classification incorrectly with a very low energy or low information delta on a, on a correct uh, oh dear. input? You know, my, I'm sorry, my, my knowledge of machine learning is still pretty limited, so I don't know what you mean by an adversarial attack. Um, yeah. Okay, maybe we can talk about it more afterwards. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, hi. Um, you talked a little bit about um, the, the expectations that you have for the energy usage of your system once you scale it up, and I'm just curious, uh, what challenges are you anticipating encountering as you work to scale your model system up? Well, so there are real questions about how should we program the thing? How do we choose our inputs and outputs? So in neural networks, right, um, um, weights can be either positive or negative. Our things are always positive. Our parameters are always positive. So how do we get around that? We look at differences between two nodes, okay? But, you know, how far, you know, how far can that, we, we don't know how well that can scale up if that's really robust. Um, we want to make sure that the outputs really feel the inputs, that they don't get so far away that there's so little effect from the inputs that it's in the noise, okay? So probably a way to do that is to use these crossbar arrays where they're, they're more, much more connected, okay? So a different architecture than what we have now. We currently hold the memory, okay, uh, with a capacitor on each edge. So this is what's called uh, compute in memory, I think it's called in, in computer science, okay, uh, where it's, it's not the von Neumann thing where you calculate, you put in memory, you take it out, and you're always shuffling things in and out of memory. The memory is in the edge. The memory is in the resistance of the edge or the gate voltage of the edge in the second generation. So that's stored in a capacitor, you know, that runs out after a while. That only lasts for so long, right? If it lasts for too long, okay, okay, anyway. So, you know, we'll probably have to shuffle things in and out of digital memory at some point, you know. But all this stuff, it all needs to be worked out. We have to start, you know, things that people have been doing for digital neural networks for decades, we had to start with square one because the hardware is different, right? We have to rethink everything from scratch. Uh, thank you for the talk. This was great. <clears throat> um, so I know for neural networks, um, over parameterized neural networks that have a lot of potentially different parameter configurations that achieve zero training error, there's this widespread belief that there's something special or an implicit bias in gradient descent that causes the network to find a generalizing solution. But you're using a local learning rule that might in general have a different optimization trajectory than gradient descent. Do you in general find that um, I know you saw, you showed this like really high accuracy for the iris data set. That was, I think, the linear network. Do you, do you expect for like nonlinear networks that you might minimize the training error, but do you think it'll also minimize the generalization error? Yes, yes. In fact, we think um, I would, oh. it's possible that it even does better, just as stochastic gradient descent does better than gradient descent. Um, you know, because our local rules are not projecting perfectly onto the direction of gradient descent, we, we probably end up, we go over small barriers, and so we probably end up in bigger minima, so that are more generalizable. So we think it may actually be an advantage. That brings up something else I, I wanted to mention, which is that, you know, all these systems are over-parameterized. That means there are many good solutions. And from the point of view for studying biological function, that is great because that means that we can study, that's the ensemble that we want where everybody in the all these solutions are, are solutions to the same problem on the problem that we want. And we have many, many different realizations of it. So as a statistical physicist, I look at this and say, yes, that's my ensemble. Now I can study the origin of function. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the, the lovely talk. Um, so I have a, sort of a vague question in search of some intuition here. So uh, with the protein allosteric example, it's always sort of like been really puzzling or surprising to me that you can have these proteins where you like, you have some little molecule that slots in on one side of the protein and all the way on the other side, it changes in this really precise way. It's just like weird, right? Because the inside of this thing isn't, isn't like the inside of a car where you have these like, you know, 
gears and levers and stuff. It's just sort of like, you know, it feels to me like it's just like mush or something, right? And same thing with these, uh, these networks here, where it's, it's like, you know, I, I mean, um, in some of the animations, we can maybe start to see some, I don't know, like pathways or something forming. But like, it, it sort of just feels like mush to me. So it's surprising that it can do these things. So I'm, I'm just wondering, is there any intuition for like, why these systems, you know, can behave like machines, even though they're sort of like, I don't know, so, uh, I don't know, mush-like? Well, I think once you think about it in terms of this minimizing some cost function and having lots and lots of adapted degrees of freedom to do it, then it becomes much less surprising, right? Because then, then, then the intuition from computer science is that, yeah, of course you can do it. Mm. But, but do you usually see the emergence of some sort of like recognizable structure from the uh, kind of unstructuredness? So, or so this like? is, in, yes, so we have looked, so we uh, just in uh, earlier this year posted a paper on the archive where we use persistent homology to analyze the you know thousands of networks. We can make thousands of networks that have the same thing. We put the source strain here and get the same target strain over here. Okay, and we can analyze thousands of them, and we find that we can take the persistent homology analysis and extract two numbers that align with what people have looked at for Alistairi, which is the existence of hinges and strain pathways. And we can quantify how important these are with two numbers. So we do this huge dimensional reduction down to just two numbers that characterize it. These networks are all over the place. There is no, no you know, clear answer like this is the structure that will always give you Alistairi. There, there, are, there are just tons of ways of doing it because there are many, many, many good solutions. And they're all different. But you can characterize them by two numbers at least. Yeah. There are many, sorry, there are many um, allosteric proteins here. <laughs> <laughs> there are many allosteric proteins. And, and in fact, proteins that are allosteric evolve very late relative to the, the earlier proteins in, during evolution. So in fact, it has taken evolution a long time in order to get to the point where an action in one part of the molecule can actually produce uh, can be transmitted to another part of the molecule. I have um, I, I have an experimental biophysicist question. Um, what about actually? It is possible to actually create these days uh, networks of of neurons that are cultivated on on agar on 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 a plate. And I was wondering, listening to your talk, if it is possible to essentially develop a simplified brain with cultured neurons that make synapses. They can make synapses and applying the rules that you are suggesting, maybe it's possible to train this network of in well, vitro neurons forming these very simple uh, networks and then make them respond in the way you, you desire by actually having an input and and expecting an output on the other side of the network. Do you think that's something that could be done? So, no, because brains use a different local rule. They don't use the coupled learning local rule. And, 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 and training the brains has been a real problem. Organoids <laughs> has been a huge problem. People don't know how to do it, mm. right? So um, I think that for us is actually the appeal of our system is that we know exactly, oh, it's just voltage inputs, voltage outputs, nothing could be easier, <laughs> right? Whereas for the, to access the brain, okay, how does it take this optical data coming through the eyes and then process, you know, it's, you know, actually training the brain is, is, is not easy. Yeah, well, and that's, I that's been a problem. Yeah, no, as I, I, as understand I understand because it. of the complexity, but I was thinking in terms of actually using 200 neurons in a very simple system, not the complexity of the brain. So, Even there, I think the problem has been training them. Yeah. Although, you know, it is, it is a complicated electrical network. It really is, it right? Is. right? So, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, think about the uh, uh, application. Uh, would this ty new type of um, real network chips be useful in outer space? Because like in the spacecraft, like, um, power is always limited, and also like in outer space, like radiation damage from the cosmic rays is 
a problem for semiconductor, right? So, I mean, like. Yes, so in fact, my, my brilliant young colleague, Mark Miskin, who designed the second generation, I mean, he's interested, he does robotics. And he's really interested in this for robotics applications where using very little power is essential. And there's actually an incubator VC company that's, that's making our circuits now. Um, uh, and they want to use it for vision applications because the idea is for edge devices where you don't want to be constantly replacing the battery. Yeah, and, and where, where you want things, the robotics, this thing about it being robust to damage is really important. Yeah, you're, 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 you're spot on. Okay, so last question here. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, you briefly mentioned how the move from linear elements uh, to nonlinear elements, such as like transistor, uh, kind of greatly improved uh, the abilities of your network. And you briefly mentioned the word non-monotonic. Um, oh, we, the there are, are not mono, non-monotonic. If they were, I think things would be is there any benefit to exploring these non-monotonic transfer functions? I mean, there are some circuit elements, right, that possess that ability. Yeah, I think that probably, you know, that that's going to make the physical landscape non-convex, and I'm I'm actually scared of going there. <laughs> Stay away. All right. <laughs> it could be great. I'm just I'm just scared of it. All right. Yeah. Okay, well, let's thank Andrea for a wonderful talk, and thank you all for attending the lecture.